Some of the oldest cheese that's ever been found is around 5,000 years old and was found in tombs in Egypt. What do we know about this early cheese? And how did cheese change and develop over the next few thousand years as the first civilizations rose and fell? Hey there cheese historians, I'm Julia and this is Cheese History, a channel all about the origins, history and impact of cheese. Now in the previous video I looked at the origins of cheese and how human beings discovered how to make cheese by accident. In this video I want to look at the next stage in the history of cheese, what we know about what cheese looked like in the earliest complex human civilizations, the Egyptians, the Sumerians and the Hittites. Now, as its name suggests, the Fertile Crescent is a fertile crescent of land. If we were to put it on a map today, it would start in Egypt and it would run up through countries such as Israel, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, touching on the bottom of southern Turkey before curving down through Iraq to the Persian Gulf. So it's about the 4th millennium BC when the first complex societies really begin to develop. And there are two main contenders for this. There's the Sumerian civilization um, that grew up in Mesopotamia, which is today southern Iraq, and there's the Egyptian civilization uh, around the Nile Delta. So they're opposite ends of that fertile crescent of land that goes through the Middle East. It's really quite difficult to say which of these two civilizations, the Sumerians and the Egyptians, came first. So I'm going to start by looking at the Egyptian culture because we know a little bit less about their cheese, but we've also had some more interesting archaeological finds relating to cheese. In the 4th millennium BC, the climate of the Northern Sahara was much wetter than it is today. This means that the land was much more suitable for grazing cattle, and the Egyptians took advantage of this. They probably had herds of sheep and goats as well, but um, the art that we have that survives um, of animals being milks shows cows rather than uh, sheep or goats. So we know at least for sure that they were indeed herding and milking cattle. Towards the end of the 4th millennium BC, around about 3100 BC, the northern and southern parts of Egypt came together and became united under the first Egyptian dynasty. We know that around this time the Egyptians were making cheese, but we don't have a great number of records that have survived through the thousands of years to today because the Egyptians kept their records on a material called parchment, which is made from reeds, and it's sort of similar to modern day paper, but obviously made out of something quite different. And like paper, papyrus tends to disintegrate, particularly when it gets wet, so it's very easy for such records to be lost to time. So while written records don't survive particularly well in Egypt, organic material does. Now in the 1930s and 40s, there were some archeological excavations in Egypt and one of the things they found in some of the tombs were some jars that had what looked to be fresh cheese in them. There were also inscriptions on some of these jars describing where the cheese came from. Now the earliest of these was in a tomb belonging to one of the first pharaohs called Hor Aha. And he was the second king of the first dynasty and ruled at around about 3100 BC. In his tomb they found two jars that contained some form of fresh cheese and these jars were inscribed with cheese of the north and cheese of the south. Hor Aha had quite a big role in the unification of the two halves of Egypt, the northern and southern halves. So it makes sense that in his tomb they would have a cheese from each of those two halves of the kingdom, symbolizing the role that he had in bringing them together. The second of these cheese-related findings was in the tomb of an unknown older woman. She was about in her 60s when she died, and she was buried with three jars of cheese that were part of an elaborate feast that was prepared to feed her in the afterlife. Now these Egyptian cheeses are some of the oldest, if not the oldest, cheeses that have survived the tests of time. They're about 5,000 years old. And just in case you're wondering, they are not edible. By contrast to the Egyptians, we know more about the Sumerian cheeses. 
because they kept their records on clay tablets, which are much more durable than the Egyptian papyrus. So we have a lot more clay tablets that have survived. The Sumerian civilization grew out of the Ubaid culture that used irrigation to cultivate the area around the Euphrates River near the Persian Gulf. So they are at the opposite end of the Fertile Crescent to the Egyptians. They had herds that were mainly of sheep and goats that they used for milk, wool, as well as meat. Uh, milk from the herds would have been turned into butter and cheese, and the butter was likely further processed into ghee. Now ghee is a form of clarified butter where the butter is melted and heated so that all the water evaporates off. The much lower water content allows the ghee to last much longer than normal butter would. So as the 4th millennium BC went on, the Ubaid peoples began to have surpluses of wool, of their crops, and of dairy products. They developed wheeled transport that allowed them to transport their goods over long distances and trade with other peoples. As their prosperity grew, they began to urbanize, and this urbanization centered around five main cities. The largest of these cities was called Uruk. They began to develop a centralized system of worship based around a central temple, rather than much smaller, more localized shrines. The civilization that grew out of all of this development, that centered around these five cities, is what we today call the Sumerian Civilization, which lasted until about 1900 BC. Now this is the point where the history of cheese takes a really quite surprising turn, one I certainly did not expect when I first came across it. The production of cheese and other dairy products became a really important part of the temple worship system in these big Sumerian cities such as Uruk. The reasons for this can be seen if we look at the stories surrounding one of the Sumerian goddesses, the fertility goddess called Inanna. As a fertility goddess, she was responsible for the cycle of the seasons, and her goodwill was really important for ensuring a good harvest. There's a Sumerian poem called Inanna Prefers the Farmer, which tells the story of how Inanna came to choose her husband. I'll put a link in the description to where you can read a translation of the original poem. What has survived of the poem is not very complete, so there's some gaps. So this is Paul Kinstead's summary of this tale. Inanna is about to choose a human spouse when she finds herself in conflict with her brother, the sun god Utu. Utu wants Inanna to marry Dumuzi, the shepherd, but Inanna prefers Enkimdu, a farmer who is able to provide her with grain, over Dumuzi, who offers her milk and cream. Dumuzi then confronts Inanna, demanding to know why she prefers the farmer. He presents an impassioned comparison of the products that the farmer has to offer, such as bread, beans, and dates, with his own products, including rich milk, fermented milk, yogurt, churned milk, butter or ghee, and honey cheese and small cheeses. He ends with a boast that he produces so much cream and milk that his rival the farmer could live off the leftovers. Dumuzi's argument carries the day, and Inanna agrees to marry the shepherd. Now, some tellings of this tale have Dumuzi and Enkimdu as gods rather than human beings. Whether they start out as human or gods, either way, Dumuzi becomes a shepherd god and the king of Uruk. He agrees to provide Inanna with a supply of milk, cream, and cheese, and in return, she promises to protect the city of Uruk and ensure that the city and its king are prosperous. So daily offerings of dairy products are made at her temple and at the temples of other gods and goddesses throughout the Sumerian cities. Because milk, butter, and cheese are really important to the religious life of the people in these cities, the temple ends up controlling the production of dairy products so that it has enough supply to provide these daily offerings to the various gods and goddesses who demand it. Because of this temple monopoly on the production of dairy products, it doesn't look like they would have been available to everybody in the Sumerian civilization. Instead, they were likely available to the people who served the temple in some way and the nobility, but not really to the average person on the street. We don't really have a lot to go on when trying to piece together what Sumerian cheese was like. All we've got is what has survived the intervening thousands of years. The Sumerians used terms for cheese which we've translated as cheese, fresh cheese, cheese flavoured with ghazi, honey cheese, mustard flavoured cheese, rich cheese, sharp cheese, round cheese, 
small and large cheese, and white cheese. These are not super helpful descriptors, but they do show that they were flavouring their cheeses with a variety of flavours, and that they were distinguishing between a multitude of different types of cheese. So because the Sumerians didn't leave instructions describing how they go about making their cheese, or descriptions of the different types of cheeses themselves, I'm going to have to speculate a bit about what forms these cheeses and other dairy products might have taken. Let's start with butter. Now butter is made from the cream or the fat that's found in milk. Now in cow's milk, these fat globules are quite a bit bigger than the rest of the molecules in the milk. So they have a tendency to sort of group together and separate out from the rest of the liquid. This is what you see in cream line milk, for example, where you get a layer of cream sitting at the top of the bottle of milk. The cream starts separating out from the rest of the milk quite quickly. And once it starts doing this, it's possible to skim off that cream, churn it, and turn it into butter. The byproduct from churning cream into butter is called buttermilk, but it's quite a different buttermilk than what you might get at the supermarket today. In goat and sheep's milk, the fat globules are much smaller than cow's milk, so they don't separate out as readily as the cream does in cow's milk. This means it's much harder to extract butter out of these types of milk. Today we would use a cream separator, or we would leave the goat or sheep's milk in a refrigerator for several days to allow the cream to separate out by itself. However, neither of these options would have been available to the people of ancient Sumer, so they would have had to do something a little bit different. One quite reasonable suggestion that's being made is that they may have allowed the milk to go slightly sour, then they could have churned the sour milk and strained it to separate out the butter from the buttermilk. I've not tried this, so I have no idea whether it would actually work, but it would be quite a fun experiment to do. Butter in the form that we're used to seeing it doesn't last very long in a hot climate when you don't have refrigeration, so they would have had to clarify the butter into ghee, removing the moisture and allowing it to last much, much longer. Whatever type of milk it is, once the butter has been churned out of the milk, you've got buttermilk left over. It's entirely possible that you could take that buttermilk, leave it to sour even further, so that the bacteria present can consume any remaining lactose and turn it into lactic acid, making it acidic and enabling any solids in that buttermilk to coagulate out into a very soft cheese. The other option is, is the skimmed milk or buttermilk could be heated to pretty close to boiling, and the combination of the heat and the acidity of the milk or buttermilk would also cause it to coagulate into a cheese very similar to ricotta. This cheese could either be eaten fresh, or it could have been formed into balls and dried in the sun so that it would last much longer. Because these were such dry balls of cheese, they would have to be reconstituted with water in order to be consumed. To make something similar to what we would consider to be cheese today, they would have needed to use the enzyme rennet. Cheese that is made by letting the bacteria acidify the milk doesn't bind together very well because you get very small particles. Rennet, on the other hand, enables the curds to bind together in a much stronger way, enabling the production of much larger and more robust types of cheese that don't require drying out in the sun as a means of preservation. There were references to large cheeses in the surviving Sumerian records, which does hint at the fact that they may have been using rennet to make these much larger cheeses. We don't know for sure whether the Sumerians were using rennet to make their cheese, because there's no mention of it in the surviving records. But because of the descriptions of larger cheeses in their records, it seems reasonable to me to assume that they were using rennet to produce at least some of their cheeses. What exactly those cheeses, or any of the cheeses they were making, were like is really hard to tell. The third civilization I want to talk about today is the Hittites. Now, the Hittites come a little bit after the Egyptian and Sumerian civilizations, and they're from what is today Turkey. Now, they are important here because they are the first civilization where we know they were using rennet to make cheese. There are texts dating from 1400 BC that mentioned rennet directly, and some of the cheeses are described as aged or crumbled, suggesting that they were hard enough to grate. 
as the Hittites were using rennet, it also means that the cheeses they were making were able to be stored for quite long periods of time and could be transported over quite long distances. Indeed, the Hittites were shipping cheeses by both land and sea around the Mediterranean. It's likely that some of the cheeses would have been shipped in jars, probably covered in a salt brine, particularly if they were softer cheeses. This would have been a cheese similar to feta. If they were harder, drier cheeses, they could well have been shipped in sacks because harder cheeses don't require the protection of a jar that a soft cheese like feta does. We also start to see cheese graters appearing among archaeological finds, suggesting that they had cheese that was hard enough to grate and in fact needed grating in order to be eaten. So next time you're grating a really hard cheese like Parmesan, remember that cheese graters have been around for over 3,000 years and they haven't really changed all that much in that time. In these early civilizations, the Egyptians, the Sumerians, and the Hittites, we see the foundations of the cheeses that we are familiar with today. From the lands of the Fertile Crescent, people spread out throughout North Africa, Europe, and through the Middle East onto Asia, and they take their cheese-making skills with them. In some areas, it doesn't really work out, such as India and China, where cheese-making never really gets off the ground in the same way that it does in Europe. Not only does cheese making travel with these people, but so do their modes of religious worship and the temple offerings that go along with that. For example, the Sumerian goddess Inanna becomes Ishtar to the Akkadians, Astarte to the people of Canaan, and Aphrodite to the Greeks. And in each of those cases, she still requires those regular offerings of dairy products. cheese is really beginning to spread throughout the world. And one of the places it will really take off is in Europe. In the next part of the series, I'm going to look at what cheese was like in the first empires of Europe, the empires of Greece and Rome. If you enjoyed learning about the history of cheese, please consider subscribing to this channel and sharing this video with anyone you might think would be interested. Also, let me know in the comments if there are particular areas of cheese history that you'd be really interested in knowing something about. I've got a whole lot of ideas of topics I could cover on this channel, but it would be really interesting to know if there are specific areas that you guys would like to see me cover. And I'll see you next time.